Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Live in Italy magazine. I am very pleased to once again welcome back Celia and Enzo, who live in Lucca. They were originally in London, and we're going to get into the background information of how they ended up moving permanently to Italy, although Enzo is originally from Naples. Uh, we're going to talk today about their YouTube channel. They also have a vacation rental called Lemura. And we're going to talk a little bit about tourism in Italy and how important it is to stay in places that take you off the beaten track. We know since we talked before in April 2022 that things have changed dramatically and probably travel this year will be at its highest. So if you love Italy, it's very important. If you want to get to know the people, the culture and the history, that you really need to discover the smaller places. My name is Lisa Morales and I am the editor of Live in Italy magazine, a travel and lifestyle publication dedicated to all things Italy. So welcome Celia and Enzo. And before we get started, I'm just gonna say again that this is a repeated video interview, which unfortunately was somehow lost. So we're doing it again. I'm going to put the link to the articles and how you can subscribe to both Celia and Enzo's channel and ours below. So please subscribe. That helps support us. And you will enjoy watching their videos and also getting to know them more. So welcome back. It's great to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> So as you know, this is Chat with an Expat, and everybody's always curious, especially in the case of a couple, to know how you met and where you're originally from. So let's start with that. Well, I'm from London. I'm from Naples, Italy. <laughs> <laughs> so we're living in Tuscany now. Um, yeah, so, so what part of Tuscany are you? Well, we uh, live between Luca City and then we have Lemura Villa Tuscany, which we rent out, uh, which is in a village above Bani di Luca, which is about 30 minutes. And it's literally the bars of Luca. It's the spa town of Luca. Yes, it is an historical uh, town that, uh, I mean, whose past goes back to go back to 2000 years, I suppose. Even more. Even more. <laughs> it's been uh, this kind of waters... Uh, springing out of the uh, the rocks for uh, such a long time for roman times right sounds amazing and it looks beautiful from the photos that you've sent so let's get into some of the personal history celia you're from london correct so tell us a bit about that what were you doing your career you know a little bit of background well i started off life as a, a classical harpist mm. and um, then I became a uh, bookbinder doing restoration and fine binding for collectors. So uh, totally different, which indeed did bring me uh, to Italy. I um, did some work in Rome during my time as a binder. That's yes. interesting. And Enzo, where are you from? I am from Naples and uh, I started my life as a a professional uh, sailor. I was an officer in the Merchant Navy and I worked for American companies uh, uh, time ago, two American companies. And I was actually working in the States uh, based in uh, Mississippi and uh, Texas. And uh, so I had my career for about 20 years. Then uh, I took one year off and uh, uh, settled in in London for some time and then we met. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I think that's a very interesting story. Who wants to tell me that one? <laughs> <laughs> we met through a um a friend who was also a colleague of mine and Enzo's best friend at university. And so uh that's that's how we met. And then uh, uh Perhaps the funny bit of the story is that um, uh, on our first date, I actually fell over and I hit my head. And Enzo, being a nice man, came and looked after me and then he never moved out. 
So, <laughs> so uh, my flatmate uh, was really worried because uh, I was living in another part of London, but I had to look after her because she had a split head. <laughs> and 30 years later, we've just celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary. It was still here. And congratulations. <laughs> 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 yeah, and, and if you go back and read the article, and I had to laugh as I was reviewing it again, is that I believe it had something to do with marble. Is that correct? <laughs> it is. I, I was coming out of a photographer um, picking up some uh, photographs, uh, and uh, I tripped and fell against a marble column, which seems quite appropriate since we're now living marble life. <laughs> yes. It, yes. I think it's, is it Carrara? What's the name? It'd be, you know, yes. you can see on Carrara. the hills, the white. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, Which I can, I can see from the window. From right the window, now. yeah. <laughs> there is a Michelangelo connection there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It must have been fate or something. Yes, yeah. there is. So fate has it that somehow you ended up living in Italy. So how did that happen? That happened after our daughter was born. And mm -hmm. um, uh, I was working very hard and uh, Enzo didn't want to go back to sea. He wanted to grow up with his daughter. And so to have a nicer life, we thought um, we could do that in Italy. And we'd come um, to show uh, the new arrival to her grandparents. And some friends took us to their house in Tuscany, actually further south. And we fell in love with the idea of living in Tuscany. Um, but mm. where they were was so remote that we wanted to be somewhere that were had easy access um, to London and, and Naples. Um, and that was just one step too far into uh, the countryside, particularly then there were very good connections. So here we chose it because it has very good uh, connections for airports and for trains. We have two airports not far from here. We've got Pisa and Florence. And uh, also it happened to be, to choose this area because uh, on the way back from Southern Tuscany, I remember a friend of mine, a colleague, because as I said, I had a, um, a little business as a, a book dealer in London. He also said, oh, if you happen to be in Tuscany, you can, uh, say hello to me and uh, in the summer he was there so we drove back to London and I told Sila we should actually stop here and say hello to Terry that, that we did and we fell in love with the area and the, the year later we came back and started the house hunting this area is incredibly beautiful because it's a uh, uh, it's wooded and uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of forest, both agriculture, and the landscape is uh, so beautiful and impressive that uh, you never get tired of uh, watching I mean, uh, the panorama here. It is really fantastic. It is really almost a spiritual experience. <laughs> and, and I think as well, we chose a village that had a, a population with children um, and an all year round working population with families because obviously living here full time, we didn't want to live somewhere that was only um, a summer place or with just a very few residents and then people would come for the summer. So that was very important to us and, and that it was in the countryside and had a mm -hmm. feeling of being remote, but wasn't really remote. Right. Um, because access was important for us. For, we had a record Winter. that we, one day, everything working, worked out in the right direction, that we left this place. We were uh, in London at your mother's place uh, in six hours, door to door, which is rather extraordinary. In six hours, mm -hmm. we, we started the trip from here, got the flight, and then right in London. So we were almost there for supper, I mean, uh, in the right <laughs> And so I believe anybody that's traveling from London to Pisa, it, it, you can get bargain prices on airfares, right? Absolutely. Yes, so I mean, many. Um, and, and now you can travel from many places by train as well if you want mm -hmm. to 
uh, be more ecological. There's uh, new trains that go from Paris to Milan or, or Turin, and then you can easily get to our area. And so we have had actually quite a few friends who've uh, arrived by train, also clients. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that um, it's a very, very good place for, for transport. And that, that was a big issue uh, for me well, because yeah. uh, friends in London, I wanted to be able to, that they could come for the weekend. Um, yeah. And many of them find it easier to come here than to go somewhere else in, in the UK or... No, it is a very strategic position uh, where we are. Look, kind of brand new. Mm. So, so before we get more into the area and then your rental and your channel, I just want to ask you because this has come up before, because through the magazine we're seeing people who have decided to move to Italy. They're not necessarily waiting to for retirement. And what I find interesting about the two of you is that you mentioned, you know, raising your daughter and the education in Italy. What were you looking for that you think you might not have found in London or any other big city? I think education is a very big uh, issue. I mean, quite a lot of um, uh, people from Anglo-Saxon countries choose to send their children to um, international schools if there are some in the area. And in fact, in this area, there are now some. Uh, however, um, one thing that I really like about the Italian education system is that it's equal for everybody. There are a few private schools, but most children go to public school and mm -hmm. there are all different sorts of public school. However, school is very academic. It's very competitive and a lot of children drop out who perhaps shouldn't drop out. Um, and I think that it it very much depends on your your child. Um, mm -hmm. And also the environment that she's lucky, if she was lucky, she got the right teachers there. So um, at least the first eight years uh, were uh, very, very good. I mean, she didn't have any problem. Um, the high school, being very selective, uh, it was a, a bit kind of hard for her. But nevertheless, she managed to get... Uh, a place in uh, in UK in university without. I, I think that um, they all find senior school is quite it's quite tough because you have uh, verificas all the time and uh, there there is a thing that the harder your school the lower your marks tend to be because you can always do better. I think that I talk to teachers now and it's changing a little bit and I I hope it is mm -hmm. um, because. Uh, her, yeah, they all uh, suffer quite a lot. Um, and mm. I think that um, if you don't, I, it, it builds their character and afterwards, you know, they find uh, university uh, very easy, but the system isn't isn't easy. And certainly if you have children who, who arrive later, it's much harder. Yes, uh, say to learn the language with this up. And I think it's important to choose the right school for your child and not um, choose a school that's too hard. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, our daughter did Lisho Classical and they had, what, nine hours of Greek and Latin every week. A week. Mm -hmm. So wow. you, they're, mm -hmm. they're students who, who want to study. And, um, you know, when I helped them and, and did some English courses there, I spent a lot of time just helping their self-esteem. Um, and they've all done amazingly well since then. Um, yes, I mean, our daughter did very well in the UK, but also her friends, uh, uh, many friends that went through university quite uh, happily in a way or another. I, I think the sad thing is that uh, uh, a lot of them have moved away since to find work. Yeah, and that's maybe a discussion for another day. I have to find a way to approach that because, you know, it's not really, but it is something when I've interviewed Italians, especially that they, you know, it's really nice for foreigners to be able to move to Italy to create investment and, and help the economy and, and, the, and you know, the, the way that they are able to do it. But there's still a problem of Italians needing to find their education in that case outside of the country higher education and also work need, elsewhere. 
yeah they they um education not so much outside it's jobs outside yes uh and um uh italian university students do do very well out, outside uh italy um mm -hmm. but i think it's uh it, it, employment isn't easy and setting up business isn't easy, though there is a lot uh, of need uh, for tech and, and quite a lot of young people come in and work in the tech industry. Ah, oh, that's good to know. Yeah. I mean, that's our future, but isn't you it? Getting visas is very difficult. You yeah. have to be sponsored by a company or mm -hmm. and self employment visa. There are very few of them. So, um, a lot of Americans seem to come uh, through sangue, through bloodline. Bloodline, because you can apply right. for an Italian passport if you mm -hmm. have a, a documented uh, ancestor. I think they go back to a century ago, or even longer. If you right. can document all these things, then uh, um, you can apply. And after a certain mm -hmm. number of uh, years, uh, you are given Italian nationality. That would open the doors to the entire European Union. So we know quite a few that uh, retired Americans, they've applied and received an Italian passport. And so they live uh, yeah. here in Europe. So at least One thing I would say is that I think um, uh, adolescents have a very nice time in, in small provincial Italy. And mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's different, obviously, uh, in big cities, I know less about it, except that uh, our niece and nephew in Naples have had um, a good adolescence, but there's a lot of freedom. You know, they right. all meet, they, um, yes. it's very safe. And um, she certainly had a lot of freedom compared to her um, British friends living in, in London. Uh, yes. I mean, we never actually worried very much when, when she was a teenager at the weekend, coming back uh, late at night uh, because she was meeting her friends and uh, whatever that. So we, I mean, provincial towns in Italy are really, I would say life is still very enjoyable because uh, it is a slow pace and uh, you have everything you need. So kids mm -hmm. actually, even our daughter, she, she's very happy. She spent time in provincial Italy when she was uh, a teenager. That sounds like an excellent decision. So, Celia, it, it, so how many years have you been in Italy, then, the two of you? More than 20 years now. <laughs> okay, so I'm guessing, then, that you're fluent in Italian. Uh, yes, though she I is. can't say I don't make the <laughs> grammatical error. <laughs> I do make mistakes in English all the time. Uh, yeah. But I did do all the exams um, uh, from the University of Siena. Um, which right. concentrated the mind. And for anyone who is thinking about moving to Italy, because I think you're about maybe the only person I've spoken to so far that's actually gone through the exams, um, hmm. or at least has expressed that. Do you, recommending to somebody, you know, wanting to move to Italy, do you recommend, you know, learning the language as soon as possible before and after the fact? Absolutely, I didn't. Uh, I mm -hmm. arrived there, um, you know, having been working very hard in London, not having time and really not thinking about it, just doing it. Um, and came here and expected to learn by osmosis, um, a big mistake. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Also, um, uh, yes, I think, and, and that's why eventually, because you, you can pick up a language fairly easy to a certain standard to communicate like your sister right. yeah uh, but actually to then get involved in a proper conversation uh you really need to have a language and i think it it also makes you feel a part of something because when you arrive in a country you don't mm. understand anything nobody knows who you are right. and it's actually a very um uh, it, it makes you think how how people look at you because you seemed like somebody who really doesn't understand anything or have a character. Uh, and so you lose a bit who you are. And I think that that is, is actually quite difficult. Um, That's a great point, Celia, because the thing is, is like, 
I imagine when you are a foreigner married to Italian, and this is something I've thought about, is adapting to a new country and culture is how to keep your self. You know, you can't move into a country dependent on your your, your spouse. That is important, right. you know, to <laughs> have your own identity, right? And, yeah. and that's key to, you know, to having the language, to be able to express yourself at a, a much higher level. So your character comes through. I love that. That's really great. So you were able to achieve that then, or you have achieved that. Uh, I, I have, yes. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and I think that, that these exams, I mean, I think that they may have got slightly easier since I did it. But mm. I haven't, I haven't looked at them for a, a very long time, but um, it, a lot of it seems uh, you had to rewrite bureaucratic language in another bureaucratic language. Well, yeah. but on the other hand, it really does make you think about construction, how a sentence works uh, and how a language works. And maybe also understand a little how people think. I mean, uh, I don't know about in America, but in the UK, my generation really love very little grammar. And I find that um, when teaching Italians English, they uh, find other languages much easier because they are taught grammar so well from the beginning of school. Mm. I mean, you know, the beginning of school here, they analyze sentences and so on. I mean, things may have changed now, who knows? Um, uh in, in other parts of the world but that that grounding um is is very important so it makes you understand the structure of the language and also how it's structured differently to your own language and and different nationalities have different linguistic problems yes definitely with a with a language um right very good point. And, and it is very easy to survive in places like florence even luca now uh without speaking uh Italian also because, because it's a large number of uh, expats but a large number of mm -hmm. Italians they speak English and they particularly the younger generation, the younger generation. so if there is a problem English. then you can ask somebody and also a lot of uh, agency they speak perfect English anyway so if you have a problem you just hire somebody that would sort out your problem but but you know just listening in on conversations in a bar or something you you learn how a community works and I also think that something very important that um, Enzo pointed out to me when I got irritated by some bit of Italian bureaucracy is that my logic isn't necessarily his logic right and Italian logic and that you have to be open-minded that you're not right just because you've done it that way forever mm -hmm. or it seems efficient to you because things work in a different way. So you need to be open-minded to the society you're going into. And I guess that applies to any country in the world. Yes. I mean, that applied to me when I was in England. I had to readjust myself. I mean, uh, try to understand how the system works there and uh, applies to everybody when you actually move to another uh, country part-time because we have people here they were live in Luca part-time or oh, full-time mm. you have a family or you decide to retire they've been uh, uh, full-time in Minito but you know that's half the fun of it isn't it absolutely yeah. you Definitely. want to be part of a different culture so embrace right. it <laughs> yeah and, and exactly I mean and, and you are the one of many couples or people who I've interviewed that have said exactly that, that you're, you're making a conscious effort to adapt to the country which you adopted. Uh, so that's really important. So I wanna talk about Piazza Talk Luca. And like I said, it's been a year since we've actually in reality have spoken and it was coming out of the pandemic and things have changed dramatically. I know even, for me personally, for the magazine, for writers, you know, life has just changed uh, now that we're back to normal. But I want to go back because your channel still is, exists. And please, again, we'll put all the links and everything. Please subscribe if you're still following along with this video. And of course, we'll put it in the article. Uh, you're making videos still once a week, right? 
So let's talk about the hit history of the channel, Piazza Talk Luca, right? Right. How did it start? Well, it, it started <laughs> um, during a snowfall, snowfall. <laughs> where we were uh, marooned up here um, uh, during COVID. And of course, COVID uh, was much stricter here. Even the second COVID was, was quite strict. Um, and also our access road actually uh, fell down in a, during that snowfall. So we were really... Um, Stuck here. <laughs> uh, and um, we loved it, actually. But uh, And now we have an amazing new road, um, state-of-the-art. So all in all, it was a, a good moment. And also um, the village and the economy had really suffered. And so... We wanted to try and do our, our bit. And going forward, we still want to try and do more and more by helping um, people who are doing uh, traditional things. So, for mm -hmm. example, we uh, a few weeks ago uh, interviewed uh, a pair of uh, a couple of young sculptors who have just finished at the Academia. Uh, in in Massa, and they are um, becoming sculptors. And one is interested in conservation, and is at the moment, in fact, working on a, a church in Pisa. So, um, trying to to encourage uh, or give a bit of publicity to um, people who are who are keeping traditions alive. Yeah, but we do everything. Also, we done farmers, farmers, but even the local restaurant that uh, cooks uh, traditional food with the highest possible ingredients, and it doesn't cost very much, which is extraordinary. And every time we find out uh, or we know somebody who's doing something traditional and really is passionate about the, the work they do or their life and things, so we make a video. We have actually a long list because we, we now we, we we got to know a lot of people, so we uh, we have a list of people we want to interview and show their life, the, the surrounding and uh, the traditions that still kept after centuries and uh, generations. Uh, we got to see in the future uh, more farmers, and they mm -hmm. produce this kind of niche. Um, Agricultural uh, produce. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, farro is the most the easiest thing, but they also produce a specific uh, uh, corn that only exists here. I mean, the, the specific uh, wonderful um, things that they done beans for generations. It's a niche market, but it's a high quality market. This is. And, and I think the important thing is that these people are are trying to make this form of of either craftsmanship or farming relevant and work in the modern world right. um, so it it it's this balance and then we try also to do uh, tourism uh, about places that are less well known though we also uh, do some of the places that are known and and often in a way sadly those get more hits than the lesser known places. But we hope by by doing some more popular places, we draw people in to discover um, an Italy that that is disappearing and uh, right. hope with, with tourism, uh, people who are really interested and want to have the Italian experience mm -hmm. will help keep these places alive and, and find a balance of, of how this can work no definitely I, I i think you know it's kind of like a popular word now authentic tourism and this is like kind of the goal of the magazine um obviously the hot spots are always going to be attractive for people you know when they get out there they're accessible but the thing is it's like tourism is a partnership and it's you making a conscious effort to you know even walk two blocks from that site or to get to that town which like you explained is so easy to do in Italy um to be to learn I mean we travel to learn and connect with people 
And in that process of, you know, getting off the beaten path, we support a local economy. So that's great. And I can't help but see that beautiful uh, painting behind you. <laughs> and of course, you've provided us nice images and you can go to their channel and see all that. But let's talk about Lemura. Lemura is a typical farmhouse. And mm -hmm. uh, what's quite fun about this farmhouse is that we know uh, it's sort of history and the original mm -hmm. family. So um, there's a little fresco on the wall that was done by um, the original family, the owner who who is actually two owners back, uh, but we know her very well. And uh, it was her grandfather who did it. And so, uh, mm. and she's also given us bits of furniture to put back in the house um, where they came from. So it's, it's rather uh, wonderful that this house uh, still exists and as a conservator I haven't really we haven't done it up it's not architectural it it was our full-time home for um, many years and so it's it's a home but it's also conserved so um, everything is as simple and original as possible. Yes this is the most <clears throat> important uh, point that uh, this house has got the original uh, I mean tiles uh, beams everything but also we know the story actually back for to from 150 years so if somebody's interested right. we not tell them how to store this house actually the house itself uh, the the central bit was built four centuries ago about the 1600 and uh, um, but we know a lot about um, we remember the, the history, how what happened to this house. I mean, uh, and how it was lived. We know exactly how a family of hundred years ago lived in this house, or the activities they had, or the stories. Uh, um, as I say, we should write them down before they get <laughs> lost, because it is a part of the local heritage. Uh, even yeah, being, you need an archive. Yes, I mean, we actually tend to do these things in every sense because mm. of the other fields as well. We we know a lot of things and I, I tend to write them down before they get lost. I mean, <laughs> and right. And you have the video channel because a lot of these things come up on the channel yes. too, the history yes. of the home. Oh, we've actually we've done a, a video about the history of the house and um, how, you know, it, it, this house uh, is on the edge of a village and the village i mean in medieval times was a very important place mm. and um you, it, it it was a very rich village um it was uh into trade they were sort of mercenary soldiers so they brought back treasures and so uh in its time it it was incredibly important also because it's very strategic between its place between Luca and Florence. Um, so uh, all these little villages have this incredible history, and we have a very small museum with with the treasures in the village. I and... mean, art at the highest possible level in the local village. I mean, Renaissance right. art, I mean, paintings and uh, uh, beautiful, also medieval statues. I mean, we talk about uh, something that happened eight hundred years ago. It's a long time ago. And they're preserved in the village, so it is beautiful. It's a wonderful. So they still have a sense of history in their own uh, everyday life, which is extraordinary. And and I yeah. think that the great thing to remember that this isn't only an area of great natural beauty, but also of historical interest. And so outside the big centres, you can still find incredible art without having to queue up with ten thousand people. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, Bani di Luca itself was uh, uh, the uh, was very popular with Napoleon's family, with Elisa Bocciocchi, who was Napoleon's sister, who was the ruler. And she sort of redesigned it as a thermal garden. Uh, mm. for, uh, uh, and how how amazing, you know, that all the establishments were had these paths that connected to them and um one of these uh, establishments has recently reopened and you can soak in a bath like Elisa did. 
<laughs> a marble bath. So um, this this kind of grandeur, I mean, at the beginning of the century, this was the place to be, unbelievable as it may seem. This right. was the resort. And uh, there was also, uh, it was very egalitarian. These beautiful villas were built and they didn't have rails so that the local population and the incoming nobility all danced together. Mm -hmm. And I think um, this sort of wonderful mixture uh, has brought something very special to this area. You know, a Russian prince built a hospital here uh, with a little temple that's based on the Pantheon in Rome. <laughs> so um, all these treasures are found outside a tourist spot without anybody right. else. And yeah, and not they, within the walls of the museum of them, in their, their original place. Yes, and the, I mean, there are, you know, thousands of places like this throughout Italy. Uh, we stopped in Palestrina and discovered this most incredible Roman temple that mm. I don't think anybody had visited that museum for years. Um, right. And it's the most incredible place. Yes, we spent, we went there, we're just driving through Palestrina and uh, um, the museum, which is uh, extraordinary, was uh, empty with just us. And so this is a modern world-class art. This is a heritage at the highest possible level. Right. And maybe just the two of us. <laughs> and, and wonderful people who, you know, because I think we're the only people they'd seen for so long, just poured out information in the most wonderful way. Yeah. What an amazing uh, experience. So Italy is a bit like that. So that's why we always encourage uh, people we know, our guests at the house, to explore places of the beaten track. Because uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, you go to a, a big place like Florence or Siena, you end up having a lot of other people there. Of course, they want to see these important things. But nevertheless, uh, you can actually see a lot in Italy just going off the beaten track and enjoy the places in peace and making sometimes some extraordinary discovery never thought of before. But, <laughs> but also, you know, in, in this area, there's a huge amount of, of sport as well. There's uh, now not exactly the white rapids one might say, but they do do rafting, obviously not in the summer, mm. uh, but right. there are wonderful walks, there's trekking in the rivers. Um, of course. So there's something for uh, uh, everybody, you know, and you mm -hmm. can combine um, sport with with art. So if you come as a, a family, there's there's something for every right. generation. Yes. Um, and, and if I could just pause you right there as we're going on, as if you're interested in, in Le Mura, it's really important for us, which I don't think we said right from the beginning, is that you rent your home. So anybody who would want to get it, talk, tell us about the home, uh, how many bedrooms, you know, uh, what types of people it might be suitable for, you know, large groups, things like this. You know, I know you have a pool. So, and also, if you're looking for those stunning kind of Tuscan sunsets, you've got got it, don't you? So you do it. You describe yeah. it for us. We, we really do. I mean, uh, we bought this house for the view. We have a view mm -hmm. over nine chains of mountains. So you've got this wow. vast event and it changes every time. And it's hard as we try to take photographs. When people arrive, they always say, but it doesn't do it justice. I don't know how you do it justice. <laughs> um, so uh, we have, uh, we rent it out up to uh, 11 people, but actually mm -hmm. we do have six bedrooms, but um, some of them in interconnect. So we, uh, we actually could sleep more, but we keep the flexibility for groups. And the rooms are very big um, so that people have space. Uh, and we generally, uh, we either have um, smaller groups of, of couples, sort mm -hmm. of eight, or we have big families uh, and um, we have cots and books and it seems to be a place that all generations like. And, and in fact, since COVID, um, our clientele has changed a bit. And we now get uh, groups of uh, younger people 
who may be university friends, we've had doctors, a lot of doctors, who just mm. really want to get out of the city and relax. And so right. they come here and they might do a day in Luca, but we often have people who, who come, you know, they ask us, uh, we have an online uh, book with information, with maps uh, and everything. And often people never leave the house. Um, they just uh, love it so much here and they just really want to relax and get away from their hectic lives, really. Exactly, yes. Uh, and so they uh, just spend their, their time here and we have a wonderful village shop and they mm -hmm. go there to get their, their produce or they can just go down the hill 10 minutes and there are supermarkets. But, you know, very often they just don't move. Mm -hmm. They come with right. all this intention of all these things and then... Doing all these things and then don't do it. No, <laughs> I, I totally get that. And I, I'm sure many of you do, yes. Uh, I mean, think... aren't meant for running around everywhere. We know, I mean, Italy is a smaller country in comparison to the United States, for example, but you still can't cover the whole country in one vacation. <laughs> so, so we can't. And I mean, I think if you do have a hectic life um, and you just want an authentic village and an authentic life, the hills are actually a, a good place. And it's, it's one of the advantage we're very lucky is that we're just 10 minutes through the olive groves uh, walk, a very slow walk mm. to a village, which means that you can live a very simple life. You know, a lot of villas um, more in Chianti are much more isolated, if you like, not so near villages. So if you like to be part of a, a, a village- Community. A community, yeah. and there's a, a summer club as well as, as restaurants in the village you uh, you can integrate to the population or not as you wish um but so, uh, um put, so, put it into perspective where where uh Lemura is so it's probably best to have a car correct absolutely you can we have hyper groups without cars but the the problem is and, and it always amazes me that buses still function um in such mm -hmm. areas but they tend to function at hours of work or school. So if you're here in summer, obviously um, school isn't there. So there are fewer buses. Uh, therefore, I would certainly say it's it's worth having a car. Um, right. And uh, let's say, okay, so the best airport to fly in would be Pisa, you said. Pisa or Florence. Florence. Or um, Florence. Okay, and I Americans seem to come quite a lot into Florence these days. Right. Um, we seem to have more more people from... That could be maybe the availability and the price of flights. Who knows? Uh, well, I, I, I can't don't know how hubs work. I, I'm so about sure. how many minutes drive from both Florence and Pisa? We're, we're about an hour from each. Okay. And then from Lemura to Luca, which you said is, you know, a growing... Half an uh, hour. city, yes, and okay. half an hour, and then there are other surrounding towns that people yeah. can explore. Yes, and then we also have a, a station in Banjuluka, uh, which, which is, is fifteen minutes by car, less mm, by car, ten minutes so by car. One can take the drive to Banjuluka and get the train, and in twenty minutes is in uh, Luca. But mm -hmm. to go to places like Florence, we suggest people go to Pescia and leave their car there if they don't want to drive to Florence. Because um, it was a bit complicated to park the car in town. I mean, there are places where to park, but they also there is the, the in Florence. In Florence, Florence, yeah, the traffic system, and uh, also there is uh, an area where you want the, the ZTL. So it is an area where you not uh, right. allowed. You're not allowed right? to. So. Uh, the, the problem we actually find lots because, of people do drive though i mean we, yeah. we tell them where to park in florence yes, uh, which is easy uh yeah. and accessible i think though that uh, uh, for people in general coming to italy they should be very aware that um italy is very controlled by cameras now driving is not as people imagine mm -hmm. wild in italy uh there are lots of speed cameras uh 
lots of ZTA, which are uh, zona traffica limitata, and you must be very careful not to go in because you Even get fined. Mm -hmm. Yes, in Luca mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And also read, what read that. lines are that you park on, and they change. So, for example, in, in Luca, white lines are free, whereas in Florence, white lines are for residents. So I can't give you a general rule. Um, and the yeah. other thing, uh, is when traveling around to download the app on your uh, of train italia and buy tickets on an app and then you get rid of the problem of stations and, uh, and convalidating your tickets and so on yeah um, and also great park, uh, there are several apps that one can download that one can pay the parking mm -hmm. certain areas uh, uh just from the app W so, which means that you can you don't have to decide how many hours you're going to be you can add to them yeah uh, we have that here i love that well, yeah. <laughs> you know no so, more searching for change or <laughs> worrying if your meter runs out yeah no i love it um that that's great well that, that's good to know now normally as we come to the end of the the interview uh, sorry, uh, I can't hear you suddenly, Lisa. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. It could be maybe I moved too forward to the computer. But I was going to say that normally in our typical chats, I ask you what your definition of an expat is and then what you miss. But I invite you to go back and read the article that, you know, the transcript of our original interview that was never uh, published, like the video. But I want to talk today about what we talked about a little bit before we started recording, which was, and I know the reason why most of the people have come to our magazine is that they're not interested in the typical tours. They've already been to Rome, they've been to Venice, they've been to Milan, they've been to, you know, Positano, the big spots. They're interested in what we call live in Italy, which is not necessarily like you moving to Italy, but more for that connection that they're searching for. So let's talk a little bit about tourism in Italy and how you feel or why you feel it's so important for people wanting to make that true connection to visit places like where you are and elsewhere that you know of because you travel to in, within Italy. I think that um, if you get out into uh, out of those big centers, into the smaller villages, into the smaller towns, you have uh, an Italy more what your imagination is. I mean, throughout the whole world, everything is becoming much more uh, global. And and certainly you can see in, in Luca in the main streets over the many years that um, we've lived in the area that the, the shops the individual beautiful shops many of them have have closed down and chains so you can get the same thing in Florence probably in New York probably um, and so you have to go even in those towns off because there are still people who are making things in Luca, but they tend to be off the main streets. So go down the side streets. Don't just stick on the main run. Um, though of course you want to see those, you know, wonderful sites and be part of the passeggiata and so on. But it is worth going down back streets and you make pretty wonderful discoveries. And the same in the villages, you know, as we said earlier, there's incredible art in the churches, uh, in small museums, and uh, local communities are becoming much more aware of their uh, history and preserving it. And local people are, are pretty passionate about their, their areas. Um, and so, and, and young people are going into agriculture, and trying to keep uh, the quality of food um, alive. Yeah, right. This is an important point because also to eat in commas authentic Italian food or Tuscan. If you go to a small 
place of the beaten track and you you hit the right uh, restaurant and uh, if you just ask the menu of the day what they have there and you can eat uh, traditional things as they've been cooking for uh, uh, centuries there. I mean, even ourselves, when we go out, we always uh, like to choose uh, restaurants in these places of the beaten track. And we had this fantastic gourmet experience, uh, often at a fraction of the price we would pay Luca or in Florence. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for example, strangely enough, somewhere we 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 send people is our local petrol station has a cafe and they cook a worker's lunch. And, you know, you certainly wouldn't go for the ambience, but the food is amazing. You can listen to the carabinieri, the... Uh, uh, bus drivers yeah. all talking. Uh, if you need an electrician, which obviously you don't if you're a tourist, uh, you can always pick up an electrician there or anybody else you know. It uh, and you get an idea of a uh, of a community there, and you <laughs> you eat amazingly well. Well, a tourist would probably just drive past, right? Um, so it's it's always worth just you know looking looking in and and now a lot of um uh, places uh, i've noticed uh it's it's happened a bit in luca and i'm sure in in other places they've they've turned things to become more bland looking uh, in a way smarter perhaps but less authentic and somehow you lose that um, italian feeling of italian bar um and I think that's right. a bit sad, um, personally. Well, anyway, the good traveler knows how to go around. If you do your research before, then right. uh, actually have the, what you want to do, the, the, the Italian experience, that what we uh, we call it. I mean, and you know, and I think tourists should be aware that um, a lot of bars now serve food, but they're mm. not necessarily the food made on there because Americans, for example, like to eat earlier than Italians. Right. Restaurants uh, open later. But I think you have to understand as well that family restaurants, you know, there's not a huge staff. And so the poor dears need a rest between lunchtime. Of and, course. And so, um, it, you know, a restaurant does not open until 7.30. Mm, especially in, right. in the city. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, if it's open all the time, it's probably a bar. Right. Which is a good place to get a salad or something. Mm. But if you want food that's cooked. Uh, Traditional Tuscan food, you have to go to a kind of proper restaurant, possibly a family restaurant. Right. Well, that that's definitely good tips. And we're expecting a busy travel season ahead. So definitely remember you are going for vacation if you're going to another country. Uh, to connect as uh, Celia and Enzo and and of course if you're not traveling this year and you're still interested in Italian food um, Enzo shares some amazing uh, recipes that you can do at home yeah that's that's the first thing I was going to as reviewing your channel it's like we're with Enzo cooking now <laughs> so <laughs> it's really good <laughs> so you know we can bring a little bit of Italy back into it yeah, so, and one of the very fun things about the channel is uh, when Enzo cooks, and people write to us and say that they've um, they've made something, and it's it gives him a great deal of pleasure that his recipes are are cooked. See, even people uh, stop me well. in the street telling me that they cook the recipe that I uh, filmed, let's say, six weeks ago, seven weeks ago. And they say, oh, I managed to do it properly. Yes, I'm so happy that you actually, the, my instructions, they're good. I mean, they're easy to follow. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, th- that's great. And I love to hear that, you know, I, you know, that the people are stopping you and saying to you, which as we conclude this, I'm going to ask you to tell us how we find you. But once again, I mean, whether it's a YouTube channel or, you know, our magazine or anyone that's there out there somewhere on the internet trying to share their stories or the stories of others. This is definitely a labor of love. 
And all that it takes is just for sub subscribe, like it, comment, you know, the feedback. And we love the feedback. It, this is not just so we can grow, you know, through the algorithm or whatever. I mean, we do this because we want to hear from you. So with that in mind, please tell us, how do we find you? We want to rent Lemora. So let's start with that. Okay. The house is actually called Lemora Villa Tuscany. Okay. Um, if you put it in uh, on Celia and Enzo, we definitely come up on the internet. And our channel is called Piazza Talk Luca. And it's called Piazza Talk because the piazza, whether it's in a village or in a city or in a town, is where it all happens. The central life. <laughs> People live in the piazza. They chat in the piazza. They meet in the piazza. And so we wanted this feeling of, of community and exchange. And that's why it's called Piazza Talk Luca. Yes. yes, another Italian tradition that should never change, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. Italian and then I'm so... They yes. live outside, you know, um, and so that's, uh, that's where it happens. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, of course, on social media, how do we find you? Uh, well, we are on Instagram as... Mm -hmm. Piazza Talk, Luca, and we're on Facebook uh, as Piazza, Piazza Talk. Talk, also Limora Villa Tuscany. We've got two Facebook pages. Yes, mm -hmm. and okay. then I open posters myself, and I'm called Celia Prosecchino. And Italians laugh at this name, but I actually uh, called myself that, and originally I had a blog under that, because um, uh, a friend of my daughter... Uh, from many years ago, used to say, oh, let's have a prosecchino together. And so um, it sort of... <laughs> you mean as in prosecco? Yes, yes. A, a small prosecco. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> a little, but a little prosecco, right? <laughs> would say why our daughters were dancing, you know, oh, let's go and have a prosecchino. <laughs> ah, right. That's so cute. That's really nice. Okay, so we'll put all those links below. And definitely, again, we encourage you get off the beaten track, give yourself a vacation and that culture connection of a lifetime. Uh, I am Lisa and I'm the editor of Live in Italy magazine. As you know, you can subscribe to our website so you're notified of all the stories. It's www.liveinitalymag.com. And then everywhere on social media, just Choose your platform of choice, including YouTube, and you just look up Live in Italy Mag, just short for magazine. So, the next interview, hopefully, will be in person. I would love to see your property. Yeah. <laughs> We'd love to <laughs> meet you, too. <laughs> okay. Thank you again for joining us. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.